everybody, and a good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Thank you for joining us for today's event, entitled Implementing a Full-Spectrum Internet of Things Environment. And this is presented in partnership with Pivot3. Um, we're very excited to be here today. This is a topic that's really a top of mind for a lot of people. So before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping items we need to cover. And the first one is some introductions. First of all, our presenter today is Mike Beaver, who is the Technical Marketing Director at Pivot3. Mike, thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Scott. And my name is Scott Lowe. I'm with Actual Tech Media. I'm sorry my uh, text was a little bit cut off. I didn't, I didn't do a good job climbing that, apparently. Um, I'm with Actual Tech Media. A couple of things before we get started. First of all, if you have questions, please make sure you ask them. As I always say in our events, the more questions, the better. And if you have questions, we will be taking them throughout today's event. This is going to be a very conversational event between Mike and myself. And if you have things you'd like to contribute or you have questions about anything to do with Internet of Things, whether that's data-related, security-related, or just life in general, please use the questions button on the console. At the end of today's event, we'll be giving away two $500 Amazon gift cards, so please make sure you stay around for that. And the other piece is there's some handouts today. So if you click the handout button in the panel, um, you will see a number of um, links in the PDF document provided by Pivot3 for you, um, as well as a link to our prize policy and our overall event schedule from Actual Tech Media. And with all of that really important stuff out of the way, we're going to get started with a discussion around the state of the Internet of Things, IoT. You know, there's a lot of hype around IoT. It's one of those things that it's, if you look at the Gartner spectrum, it's not, you know, the the, the peak of inflation or whatever it is, of inflated expectations. Um, and there's a lot of things that need to be covered. But first of all, really, what is the Internet of Things? I think this is one of the things we have to sort of get beyond. What does this mean? And it means different things to different people. You know, if you look at dictionary.com, it's the interconnection via the Internet of computing devices embedded in everyday objects, you know, enabling them to send and receive data. From Wikipedia, a similar definition, we talk about vehicles, home appliances, software, sensors, actuators, and other things. From futurists, it's going to change the world. And from IT pros, it's the next thing I just have to support. So everybody has a different perspective, really, on what the Internet of Things means. And I think that's really important to understand this. Everybody's perspective is going to be different on this. And it's, um, it's important to understand those different perspectives when you're looking at your own company's Internet of Things strategy. We're going to start with our first poll question um, that we want to ask the audience today before we actually get into what the Internet of Things is. So the question is, how much do you know about the Internet of Things? And while we're talking that, about that, um, I'm going to have a chat with Mike around a couple of topics. And one of the, the first thing is, is when we think about Internet of Things, as the audience will learn shortly, it's really about massive scale. Um, and there's going to be, and that means scale both infrastructure and breadth of deployment. You know, what challenges do you see that people are going to see around scaling Internet of Things projects effectively? And understand they're going to get more of an introduction to this over the next few minutes. Yeah, I mean, for me, there, there's two real things to this. The first is management, and the second is resilience. So on the management side, um, we're talking billions of sensors. I mean, at home in my house, my fridge is an IoT device. My washing machine is an IoT device. It actually has an app that I have on my phone and I can start and stop my washing machine and it will tell me when it's finished. But I also know that it's sending data back to the manufacturer that says what time of day I used it, how heavy the load that I put in there and what program I selected. Um, they're not going to get very interesting information on that one. I use either white clothes or not white clothes. It's uh, pretty basic for me. But that is all then being used to develop um, kind of wider or better or more appropriate washing machines for, for people like me who have two basic settings. Now, if you think of the number of washing machines that are out there or the number of devices that could be out there, even in a corporate environment, managing those is going to be beyond the realm of anything a human could ever cope with. I mean, 
I struggle to manage sort of three, 400 devices in a corporate network back when I worked in an end user environment on my own. So managing billions of connected sensors is going to be really tough. So orchestration, automation as part of management, uh, managing by policy is going to be very important in that. Now on the second one, on the resilient side, this uh, to me is paramount. We are not in your nice cozy data center anymore. This isn't a uh, Halon um, fire protected system with air conditioning and uh, lovely wide corridors and heat aisles and cold aisles and things like that. We are out at the edge. Now, to some people, the edge is a remote office somewhere over there with a server cupboard or maybe under the stairs or if you're really lucky, a server room with a fan by the door that, that blows cold air from the corridor in. We're actually going further than that as well. We're going out into the wild. I mean, sensors being deployed in national parks or being deployed throughout cities, kind of stuck to the back of traffic lights. So resilience of those devices, especially in the number that we have, becomes absolutely paramount as well. It's You can't have a fire detection system or you can't have a pollution detection system where half of your sensors have gone out and you've got to have someone running around frantically to fix them if there's thousands upon thousands of them in the environment. So between those two things, I think uh, those are the biggest challenges for me when we're, when we're dealing with scale. You know, if we look at the responses from our audience um, about how much they know about this topic, um, a number of them really have just, uh, you know, just under a third are, you know, uh, newbies when it comes to Internet of Things. So, you know, as we would expect, a lot of people have moderate knowledge about this, and a few people are IoT gurus, which is, you know, that's good. Um, so when we think about what we see in the world as far as what is an IoT device, now, this is one of those things where the, the answer is really nebulous. And if you look at where we find IoT devices, I mean, really you can think about your Apple Watch or whatever you want, whatever you wear on your wrist, um, your phone, in your home, as Mike alluded to, your refrigerator, my home, my garage door opener, um, you know, my Nest thermostat, um, you know, the doorbell and the, the, ring, the ring doorbell, things like that. Those are all IoT devices in the home. And obviously we see lots more than that today. We see people with, you know, with, uh, you know network-enabled light bulbs and all this other stuff. Um, we see IoT devices strewn about offices these days, embedded in industrial appliances. Um, you know, if you look as if we look at the you know, manufacturing, these devices are all network based. Um, healthcare is a huge opportunity for IoT to improve healthcare outcomes. Driving down the highway, um, you know, if you look at autonomous vehicles, those are IoT devices. They are devices that require data that need to be on a network in order to operate. We'll be talking more about um, autonomous vehicles later on. And retail stores, I mean, we see Amazon stores starting to pop up where you walk in, pick up yourself off the shelf, and you walk out. You never go through a checkout line. That's all thanks to the Internet of Things and all of the sensors and, you know, the localized networks that are available to support those types of environments. And fields and agriculture. Agriculture has been transformed because of technology. The electrical grid spread around cities, smart cities, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later, in which Pivot 3 actually has quite a lot of experience. Um, you know, Mike, there's, I'm sure that there's a million different things we can talk about. Can you briefly think of something I don't have here that is something that people should be thinking about as far as IoT goes? Yeah. Um, well, the interesting one for all those newbies as well from the, um, uh, from the poll question is you're actually probably doing IoT in your company right now. Or I guarantee that you'll have been interacting with an IoT device that has been around for a number of years that you may not even have thought of. And that's video surveillance. It is the classic definition of IoT. A camera is a sensor that captures data, transmits it, stores that data somewhere, whether that's um, on just off the camera itself, whether that's in a data center, that data is being stored, and that data can be analyzed to give you insights. And if you think how much information you can gather from one piece of video, then you're in a great place right there. So, I mean, literally, we are surrounded by video surveillance nowadays. We are constantly being watched. But that technology's been around for 30, 40 years. It's been IoT for 30 or 40 years. So hopefully that, that might pick something out that um, 
is absolutely everywhere, but not everyone thinks about. Yeah, and this, I mean, the, the diagram that I just put up on the screen is just to show that there's, I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, everywhere you go, from work to home to the farm to um, what have you, there's places for uh, IoT. But, you know, one of the things that we think about when we think about any technology is what does it enable? What does it allow us to do that we might not have done before? When we look at, you know, all of this stuff, there's also some potential downsides we have to think about and some realities that I want to make sure that everybody understands here because we have an IT crowd here, and this is obviously all going to be uh, of most interest to them and how it impacts their, you know, their day-to-day -day life. And when we think about the good, you know, smart homes inherently are a good thing. We can think about things being more energy efficient. I mean, if you look at your thermostat, um, it can watch the weather. It knows when you're home and when you're not home. And it can adjust the, the home temperature accordingly, which can save you money and it can be better for the environment. Um, and that's just one example. Um, you know, for the garage door opener thing, it's more, you know, from a quality of life thing, maybe it's not that important, but it's nice. Because, for example, I, I had a, a package that needed to be delivered when I was out of town. So I, the FedEx guy called me. I opened up the garage door from my iPhone, and then when it was done, I closed it and he put the package in the garage. Um, smart cities obviously have some profound implications, which we'll talk about later with Mike. Um, agriculture, healthcare, smart everything, basically. But there's also some things we have to really keep in mind. Everything, you know, the hype is really easy to hype up when it comes to new technologies like Internet of Things. One of the things that is a very common concern around IoT, though, is security. We'll be talking more about that in just a minute. Um, but there's also uncertain outcomes. What is it really going to do for me? And, or is this a solution in search of a problem for some organizations? And those are some things that only, really only you can determine for yourself, but do it with an, informed, um, with an informed mindset. And the reality is that IoT will have some impact on, um, on IT. It's, as Mike just talked about, this idea of the edge. Um, you know, we're, one of the things we do at Actual Tech Media is we write these books called Gorilla Guides. And we're revising one right now that had a chapter that we wrote originally three years ago that was called Robo, Remote Office uh, Branch Office. And we've really we've retitled that The Edge, and Remote Office and Branch Office is really just one component of this um, uh, rise of the Edge network. Um, an Edge network includes branch offices. It includes potentially secondary data centers. It includes you know, autonomous vehicles. Anywhere where there's a device um, today is really part of The Edge. And we'll talk more about that in a minute as well. And the other reality we have to think about is the potential data tsunami that results from a lot of these devices. And the thing is, is you don't always control all the data. Um, in some cases, you have to make accommodations for the data that gets to your data center or to where your long-term data repository is or to where your analytics tools are. But in some cases, it's a question of whether or not you even own the data. And that's something that's critical to understand as well. And really, the other reality is interconnectivity. You know, IoT devices, um, some of them are um, you know, there's near field communication for credit card readers, but they have to have an uplink to the internet securely and all this other good stuff. But it really does change the way we build networks as well. And when we think about things like the f upcoming 5G revolution, that's going to be huge for things, um, for the internet of things, uh, the entire scenario. Um, and we're going to get to, I want to get to one more statistic and then we're going to have another quick conversation here. You know, as of August or so, there were about 8 billion, 8 billion IoT devices worldwide with a projection of, of 17 billion such devices by 2025. Those are staggering numbers. And it doesn't mean that there's 8 billion different devices. It's 8 million devices. I mean, it's 8 million different manufacturers. Um, but there's 8 million devices out there. And when you think about it, the breadth of the device landscape in, in this market, it can be overwhelming. So, Mike, when we think about IoT, as we mentioned, scale is huge. And I think that what we're talking about here really reinforces the point that scale is huge for this. When we talk about 8 billion devices, the rise of the edge network and new internet, uh, new connectivity needs, especially around 5G. Um, but one of the biggest concerns we have is security. Can you briefly give me your thoughts on what your thoughts are around security in the realm of IoT? We'll be talking about this more in a few minutes as well. Yeah, um, I had a really interesting story on this. I did uh, Pivot3 works, as, as you've said a couple of times, with a number of smart cities, and we're deployed, um, and there's a case study on this on the Pivot3 website, um, for the city of Bogota in Colombia. 
So absolutely beautiful city. And they've got uh, nearly 2,000 cameras looking over that entire city. But the weak point in security isn't so much the cameras or that kind of thing. It's the ability to respond to that information. And then there was a number of public forums around there. And we had to go down and present to the public forums. And the question that came up every time is something the IT industry doesn't often consider. We only see the good. Just naturally in the IT industry, we're inventing a product, we're creating an IoT device to benefit the greater good, to make life better for someone. Or in really kind of cynical terms, to make life better for my company so they make more money and I get paid more. But we're, we're generally thinking about the greater good here. The public, on the other hand, the non-IT specialists, the uh, everyone day-to-day, -day, the citizens of Bogota, the first question out of their mouths was, are you doing this to improve my life or are you doing this to watch me and wait for me to do something wrong? Are you just waiting to trap me somehow or are you manipulating me or social engineering me by putting all of these devices in and collecting all this data and analyzing all this data. How are, you, um, how are you managing that? So that's a very big concern, as you quite rightly mentioned, Scott. So that human element is uh, incredibly important. I would say to anyone uh, outside of IT, in IT, always, always understand what data you're giving away. Now, the other side of this, and um, uh, another thing that came up or a scenario that comes up commonly uh, when we work at Pivot3 with uh, video deployments or security deployments is, well, how, so, how safe is the endpoint? Well, the endpoints, the endpoint, the manufacturers will go as far as they can uh, to secure the endpoints. There have obviously been a, uh, a number of vendors in the media recently with exploitations and holes. They're always going to be found. There is always a way in. There's always a back door. But in the reality of it, especially in the video and the security world, it is a lot of effort to go and hack an endpoint. It really is. A lot of effort to go and try and capture that data stream, which will generally be garbage unless you've got the right software to decode it and the right people who understand what the information is telling them. What's much cheaper is to use a human. And if you want to hack a video camera or tap a video camera and look at a street, Maybe you're looking for a particular person or you're looking for a particular type of person. It's actually much easier to have someone stand on the street corner that's part of the gang or part of the organized crime ring and watch that street for you. Use the human element. But that then applies on the other side of security as well. We see a large number of breaches come from managing the infrastructure or managing the security of the data once it's hit that repository that Scott mentioned. So end-to-end -end security is, is great personally for me i would worry slightly less about the device and more about the data itself um, in terms of what i'm going to protect and what i'm going to look at but really understand that human element element of this it's not just about a device and capturing data and all of those kind of things there is real impact and an impact on people's lives as well now that was an interesting um take on security that we don't always know what people are going to do with the data that's collected from these. And I think that's often overlooked, especially as we focus on securing the devices, because we look at that as a, as a security um, piece often. Um, and, you know, even though maybe the device is not easily itself hacked, I see the, the human element also taking a sort of a front seat when it comes to um, the device security as well. I mean, there's stories abound of, you know, the these Internet of Things devices that have default passwords that people don't change and things like that. And that's just, you know, humans making an error. Um, but one of the challenges I see from a security perspective, um, from a device perspective, is there's so many of these devices that if there's a common security vulnerability on a platform that's widely distributed, like we saw a couple of years ago, um, if you can harness the power of enough of these devices, you can do some really bad things. Um, and that was why we saw a couple of years ago uh, a worldwide DNS issue because there was a, denial, a distributed denial service attack from IoT devices um, against a popular DNS provider. Um, so, you know, these 
from a security perspective, keeping these devices secure is not just about make, protecting your organization, but it's also about making sure that people can't create these massive distributed networks that they can then use to target an attack that can be crippling for the worldwide Internet and things like that. So there's a lot of things, I think, from a security perspective that have to be considered. We'll be talking about some, some of those things um, during this presentation. But one of the things that I want to talk about first is this idea of the edge. This, idea, this edge network is a relatively new term. It's been around for a couple of years now. Um, but as I mentioned, it's replaced some other terms that encompasses remote office, branch office now. But why is the edge so important, particularly as we look at um, Internet of Things and as we look at um, really, I think when we couple this with some artificial intelligence type needs. So as we look at the edge, we mentioned that Internet of Things devices can include things like autonomous vehicles. Well, as we start to look at a lot of services, such as the needs of autonomous vehicles, processing power closer to an application has become essential. This is not really something that's you know, optional. You can't, for example, and I'll, this, goes back, this goes to latency as well. So the latency between devices and applications and data centers in the cloud is not acceptable. You can't have an autonomous vehicle that is, making, that is looking at the, the road ahead and sees a person and then has to upload a bunch of data to Amazon for servers there to do some crunching and send the, the, send the result back. I mean, by the time that's happened, the person's been hit. Um, and you need the car to be able to operate autonomously, even if it's off network. Um, you know, we all know that cell service goes down and, you know, networks go down. So there has to be these basically mobile data centers um, that are not in a data center or are not in the cloud, but they have incredible processing power um, that can't, can't afford latency in their applications. I mean, in a lot of cases, um, you know, we, if, if we're going to, you know, YouTube and there's a little latency, it's annoying, but who cares? Um, but if you're, and if you're driving a Tesla down the road and there's latency and it results in someone being killed, um, that's a problem. And so the idea of, the, of processing at the edge, you know, we, especially as we start combining these high CPU services with uh, IoT, it really does change how we think about our data center. We have our, da our traditional data centers um, that we've always had, but we've always got these, we've next got these, um, these emerging devices uh, that, on the edge that are so important. Um, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. There's also this need around to, to, that we see emerging more around data management. This is taking on, in fact, we have an entire ecocast, um, I believe next week on data management. Um, data management is a huge topic today. And it's not just about you know, your data storage, although that's a huge component of it, but it's around what are you going to do with that data? And that's what Mike just alluded to. Um, what, what are you going to do with the data? Why are you capturing it? What do you actually have? And is it secure? So data management is a huge topic um, that IT needs to be thinking about in the context of IoT and really everything it does moving forward. And as I mentioned, there's going to be network connectivity impact when we start thinking about IoT as well. Mike, in, in particular, let's talk about this data management idea. Um, I really see IoT as the beginnings of a conversation around you know, fundamentally rethinking how we deal with data. What are, what are your thoughts on overall you know, data management needs, especially in the context of IoT? Uh, the volume. I mean, we are going to move. Uh, we are in a terabyte world right now. We have just broached largely the petabyte world. This is going to take us wildly quickly into the zettabyte world. The sheer volume of data management is going to be, uh, sorry, the sheer volume of data is going to be huge. And managing that data and making sure that data is clean and making sure that data is within regulation or within uh, compliance requirements is going to be a monumental task. If you look at GDPR in the UK uh, and, and throughout Europe, then you see uh, there's, a, there's a piece in there called the right to be forgotten. So you can go to any organization and say, I would like you to remove any trace of personal information about me from every single one of your systems. Now, if you're dealing with maybe not a year's worth of data, but five, ten years down the line, if you're dealing with that volume of data and you've got to go and scrub that person out of all of that data and any identifying information, 
managing that and actually delivering that is going to be enormously complex. Now, personally, I feel that the global governments have missed a chance here. And Scott and I were talking about this uh, before, we, before we came online. They have taken what seems to us to be a very laissez-faire approach to data management about what data is collected, how it's, how it's collected, how it's stored. They've kind of just gone, eh, uh, we'll deal with it when the first lawsuit comes in. Uh, you missed a trick there, I'm afraid. If you had set a good set of solid statutes, compliance, regulation, right at the very start of this, then you could have bound and you could have been cast iron in, in what you're asking people to manage and how you're asking it to manage it. The goalposts are consistently moving. So for all of the IT guys associated with data management, you are now going to deal with a world where the boundaries and the goalposts and all of these kind of things are constantly moving. We're not just dealing with emails and exchange data anymore. We're dealing with potentially sensitive data about people and their own uh, their way of life, things that can directly affect them, things that can be used uh, positively or maliciously against them as well. So data management is going to be huge in that respect. So I think really there... Uh, there lies the challenge and, and for the IT guys and for the data management and compliance guys, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. Um, you have not got a pleasant world coming up for you. You know, one of the things we also talked about before we started the um, event, this kind of uh, dovetails what you just mentioned around some regulatory um, potential with, you know, emerging technology is, Let's just focus on autonomous vehicles for a minute. You know, one of the things, I, my son just turned 15. And um, so last month he got his learner's permit and everybody tells me, oh, you must be terrified. And it's like, no, actually he's doing a really good job. So I want to, you know, he's very careful. He's, he's taking his time and doing the things I want him to do. But one of the things that as we look at the quote unquote rules of the road, they're not necessarily there so that we, the, the, the the reason for their existence is not solely so we know what to do. Part of the reason for their, exist their existence is so as we're driving down the road, we have an expectation about what other drivers are going to do so we can make appropriately informed decisions. And when everyone doesn't follow those rules, like we have a, in my town, I'm sure it's, a, it's every town in the country or the world, we have four-way stops and we have a single, I live in a small town, a single traffic circle. And I can't tell every day someone does it wrong. They'll get to the four-way stop at the same time and then they'll start waving each other on or they'll, it, it, it's, they'll stop at the entrance of the traffic circle when the traffic circle is empty and there's, that's not what you're supposed to do. So it breaks those expectations you have for other drivers. As we start to get into the world of autonomous vehicles, that's all going to change. All the cars technically, at least the ones in the same manufacturer, are going to do the same thing. And I see a, a world where as I'm looking forward to the world of 100% autonomous vehicles because everybody will do the right thing then. But I see a time in between now and then where it's going to be a mess because you're going to have human drivers doing things that, that autonomous vehicles don't expect. And autonomous vehicles are going to do it, quote, unquote, correctly. But, Mike, there's some regulatory need potentially around even things like that. There needs to be industry-wide you know, rules that these vehicles follow. What are your thoughts on autonomous vehicles and following the rules? But I agree with you entirely. Um, the other thing that really gets me is that humans make uh, a life mission, it seems, to game the system. And I have absolutely zero doubt that once people kind of figure out the behavior of an autonomous vehicle and they know that they can just cut across the front of it and that's going to stop, then they're going to do it. Humans are unpredictable by nature. They will make 10 different decisions in the same scenario 10 different times. So I agree with you entirely. I think we need to go to a world or we need to get to a world as quickly as possible where it's 100% autonomous vehicles or it's not autonomous vehicles. Now, where you were talking about um, kind of the different manufacturers, I think it's important to set or to, important to have a behavior for those vehicles. Each vehicle or every vehicle, regardless of manufacturer, should react to the same scenario in an identical fashion. Otherwise, you start getting into 
um, you start getting into kind of vendor wars, as it were. You can imagine Tesla looking over at Ford and going, well, we know the Ford behaves like this in this scenario. So if we program our car to do this, we'll always get a jump on a Ford. Or we'll be able to cut a Ford up, or we can kind of enhance our own kind of reputation as getting you from A to B quicker in a Tesla um, than a Ford. So I think there's got to be a lot of regulation about how the cars react and how the cars behave um, once we get to that. And then also, who controls the data that the car is creating? Um, I wrote a piece recently about autonomous vehicles that talks about how the vehicle can interact with the city itself. So sensors on the vehicle, as the vehicle is driving down the road, can identify potholes, um, identify differences in road conditions, things along those lines, and they can transmit that back to the city itself. It's not just about traffic or stop traffic, which your GPS does now, but it's about the condition of the road, or it's about um, sudden events or uh, objects being detected, things along those lines. Now, who owns that data? Does the car manufacturer own it because the car generated it? Or is there a requirement for that data to be owned by the city so that they maybe can go and fix the potholes a bit better or a bit faster um, in that way? So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done about who owns data, who collates data, how it's collated, and uh, how it's then used and, and interacted with. Um, things like, are the cars going to be able to do biometrics of its own passengers? You get into the car, and the car takes your heart rate, and it takes... Uh, your weight and all of these kind of things and your blood pressure as soon as you get in. And then it chooses a speed that is designed not to elevate that blood pressure so that you don't, uh, you, you don't get stressed and you have a nice relaxing journey. There's probably a limit somewhere along those lines, but uh, I don't think we can even see what it is yet. Uh, a reminder to the audience, if you have any question at all about this topic or whatever, um, please make sure you ask it. Was it just intended to be um, engaging and uh, conversational, so we want to get your thoughts as well. Um, so again, if you have questions, um, hopefully we can have a, a great discussion about that. Um, we move on to our next slide. So you know, if we think about again, I want to go into the security factor for a second. There's a number of things on the device level that we have to think about, um, and this is really when we think about it as IT pros, what we focus on. And it's been unfortunate, but in the recent years, IoT has become almost synonymous with insecurity. You know, we think about these devices that. And it's not necessarily because the devices themselves are inherently insecure. In some cases, they are. Um, but it's because of what we've done. And part of the problem is the device manufacturers come and go. And I actually had a um, discussion of, on this very topic um, with the Tech Field Day crew a couple of years ago, um, that there's no permanent support mechanism. Once the, once the manufacturer goes away, there's no more updates, which means if there's any vulnerabilities on that platform, it's done. You don't get updates anymore. And you don't always know that the device manufacturer has gone away. And so you could be running a, a device that you just truly don't know if it's being updated anymore. And as we know, everything has vulnerabilities. I, don't, I, I would not name one thing anymore that doesn't have a vulnerability. I mean, even your password manager um, has a vulnerability. Um, you know, they, they all have vulnerabilities. You have to use one password or any of those. They're all, there's, all, there's ways to get into all of them. Um, I read an article this morning actually on one password and last pass and key pass that terrified me a little bit. Not, you know, I'm not going to stop using them, but you know, there's just everything that we have to think about um, with those things. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've seen is default configurations in use. People don't change default passwords because that way the passwords, they always know it. They can look it up in the documentation. And that means that anyone can know it because it's in the documentation. And we see this all the time with people keeping default passwords on things um, and that's where you get into trouble. It's one of the w places you get into trouble. Um, and when we think about the support side of things, they might be using code that isn't well maintained, um, and which means that there's potential vulnerabilities. And it's not, again, not necessarily the fact that your home network is going to be hacked, but it's the fact that you're going to basically turn those devices into zombies um, that can then be used to launch a distributed attack against something else. And there's a lack of standards. I mean, in order for these things to work, you know, you almost have to put them and put individually on separate VLANs. And we were talking again before the event. In my house, I have multiple VLANs, one for these devices and one for everything else. Um, and it means because there's network holes everywhere in these. We just don't know all the time 
what they're going to do. Um, we're going to keep going. We'll take the questions we have from the audience in just a minute because they're really good ones, and I don't want to I don't want to skip them. When we think about IT infrastructure, the things that the people in our audience have to focus on every day, first of all, we have the edge. We have this emerging idea that we need to have edge environments, which is the truth. Um, it is happening. That data has to roll up somewhere, so we often have that going to a data center. We're not going to be getting rid of our data centers anytime soon, but we also have the cloud. So we have a need for some new things that we didn't have in the past. This means that we have to have new security tools that we have in place that can help us analyze uh, the devices that we have in the network, but also wherever they happen to live. Um, so it requires us to re rethink how we manage all of this stuff from a security perspective. We have new networking services. I mean, even smaller organizations may have to deploy a bunch of wireless services outside the bounds of the four walls of the data center and the organization to support all of the uh, needs that we have around the Internet of Things. From a storage perspective, one of the things we talked about is this data tsunami. You know, old ways of doing storage aren't going to work anymore. We have to be thinking about scale-out storage with things like hyper-converged infrastructure um, in order for organizations to be able to continue to react and grow in a reasonable way. We can't have old, you know, lift and shift sort of storage services that we had out there. Um, when I say distributed computing power, this is about the CPU, the diagram you see on, on the screen. Um, really, one of the things that's happening with storage and with computing powers, we're seeing an overarching fabric that has to emerge atop all of these things. We need to be able to seamlessly move workloads or operate workloads at the edge, the data center, and the cloud without having to fundamentally transform those workloads. Um, so we need to have this almost an abstraction layer of sorts that makes sure that we have the ability to run workloads anywhere and everywhere when we have to. And it all has to be fast. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, as we look at the Internet of Things, a lot of what needs to happen has to happen in real time, which means we can't afford latency and we can't afford slow. And so we have to have faster infrastructure everywhere we operate it. And I don't think that's something that's really um, a discussion anymore. At this point, we have to have things that just work and that work fast. So I'm going to talk about the potential here. Then I'm going to go to a poll question, and then we'll go to a, uh, some questions from the audience, and then we're going to hear some more from Mike, and we're going to have some more discussion. So when I see the potential for Internet of Things, I think it does have the potential to be transformational. Um, as I mentioned, I am personally looking – I love to drive. I love to do things like that. But I'm looking forward to the day when I can get in my car and go to sleep when I have to make a five-hour trip. I don't know if we're ever going to be there in my lifetime, but that will be a beautiful thing. Now, as we, as we look at our organization's digital transformation efforts, they're potentially going to have a significant IoT component. Um, and that's just reality. People are getting more comfortable with, integrating, with interacting with technology, and it's going to be part of our digital efforts as we become, uh, as we start to really rethink our IT processes and how um, they can be, become more customer-centric in such, in such initiatives. The outcomes from an IoT initiative can be very local to improving a sing, single process to global. Um, you know, for example, we talked about the smart city initiatives and things like that. It will require a potential fundamental rethinking of how we do IT infrastructure with this idea that we have to have a very distributed or organization from the cloud to the data center to the edge with a fabric that rides atop all of it. And it's going to require an intense focus on security. Those are things I think that are not really um, up for discussion, to be perfectly honest. Our next question is, where is your company on a IoT journey? You may not know, or you may not have started one, or maybe you've done something really great with it. While we're doing that, let's take some questions from the audience. Um, one of the person says, agree that there's a huge lack of standards. That's a problem. Um, so from one of our audience members, it says, he says, it seems there will be lots of data to be processed. Big data and artificial intelligence come to mind. Do you see applications in this area in terms of IoT? What are your thoughts on that, Mike? Uh, yes is the short answer, absolutely. Um, AI is a funny one for me. Because I don't believe we are at the uh, stage of AI yet. Uh, a lot of companies will call themselves AI, and you'll, you'll see it all around the industry. But where I believe we are there is um, what we refer to as machine learning or ML. Because the software, the technology is not thinking for itself. It's not learning for itself. It's not doing that independently. So it's 
a, a phase where we're still telling it what to do and what to go and look for and tell us when you found it. And if you see other things like this, tell us too. And that's fine. That's great. That's a great step on the evolutionary chart. It's not going to start making insights. What I think we can move towards with this whole big data and this whole um, AI side of things is um, a, a real live example, in fact. We can start taking sociological feeds or meteorological feeds and applying them to data sets where we may not have thought about it before as humans those intuitive leaps that sometimes you read about, that somehow someone connected uh, something way over here in left field with something way over here in right field, and it happened to be correlated and causal and all of those kind of things. Uh, and an example I'd like to use of that is up in Toronto. There's a pedestrian system called PATH. Um, it's an underground system where you can enter from multiple places and you can walk around under the financial district in the downtown area of Toronto. Now, what's interesting for me on that is that we know in general that when it's either wet or cold or cold and wet, people are driven down into path. Traffic increases. Now, but is there a threshold where that happens? Is it, say, uh, 40 degrees Celsius? Uh, sorry, Celsius, Fahrenheit. Is it 32 degrees? Is it 20 degrees? Or is it a curve where it kind of gradually goes down and only the hardiest uh, hardiest of souls are left on, on the surface uh, walking around the empty streets of Toronto because it's uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Tying those bits of data together would give you then the ability to understand or give you actions that you can take from that data. But you want to do that over a long time. Now at Pivot3, we refer to um, IoT in almost three types of analytics, micro, medium, and macro. Classic example of a microanalytics would be a fire alarm. So you're looking for an instant response to a single or a very, very limited range of uh, stimuli, uh, carbon particulates, temperature, something along those lines. What you don't want to do, as Scott's mentioned earlier, is send that data back to a data center and, or the public cloud, chew on it for a while, and then send a response back that goes, yeah, probably should sound an alarm, um, let's go ahead and do that. Your building's burnt down. Really sorry. So you don't want that. In the microanalytics, you want that instant response. That generally tends to be real time, uh, very short bursts, or very uh, isolated single incidents. Media analytics is a little bit wider than that. Maybe a whole city block where you want to look at air quality monitors, water quality monitors. Um, those fire alarms are built in there and maybe video cameras. So you're getting a broader, more vivid picture and context. And that's very important in IoT is applying context to these things. And then you're looking at macro analytics, which is where your big data and your AI really comes in. Traffic patterns or pedestrian patterns for an entire city over the last five years. How did people flow around the city move? How did those... Um, new road systems or new road signs that I put in to redirect traffic, how did they work? Where did they create my bottlenecks? How did they resolve them? So those long-term analytics, I think, are where we're really going to see uh, big data and AI play a massive value. AI, when it gets to the stage where it uh, goes and makes those connections and proves those connections between those completely unrelated or seemingly unrelated sets of data. Sorry, very long answer for a very short yes. I think there is. <laughs> That's quite right. There's actually, I want to ask one more question before we keep going. Um, this is an important one. Are there separate considerations for HIPAA-related IoT initiatives, particularly wearables such as Apple Watch, and relaying patient vitals to an electronic records management system? Uh, or electronic, uh, I'm sorry, electronic medical record system. So when we think about different industries with different compliance requirements. Do you see um, do you see separate considerations for that sort of stuff, or do you see this the need for an overarching sort of um, set of regulations? Uh, for me, there? yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, HIPAA's a great one, because HIPAA pretty much controls everything. Believe it or not, 
uh, a lot of video surveillance in hospitals and healthcare facilities uh, is governed by HIPAA. Uh, you can obviously tell a lot of information about a person uh, by their video. Um, the answer is going to be yes, but it comes more down to the data that's generated and who has access to it. Now, I wear an Apple Watch myself, and I have uh, Apple Health Informatics in there. It monitors my heart rate uh, throughout the day, and it tracks all the peaks and the troughs and all of that kind of thing. And my health insurer has access to that because I chose to let them have access to that because it affected my premiums. Now, that's a UK-specific thing. Now, that might be true in the US as well. Um, I can't, can't really comment on that. But it came down to choice on my own part. So there is a very large part of HIPAA that is about patient choice and consent. And it is the consent of data. So make sure that um, if you're working in a HIPAA-regulated environment, if you're going to deploy IoT, um, I'd love to have a conversation with you because we're working with uh, a number of hospitals right now on this exact kind of thing. Um, make sure that it is very, very clear to your patients in language they understand the choices they're making, the consent they're giving, and what data is being collected. That would be my main advice around IoT. Um, and also, this sounds really, really daft, but make sure they understand the benefits. Do not be afraid to have them understand the benefits of, of what this data is going to give them, but don't do it in terms that looks like legalese and all of that kind of thing or in the tiny, tiny fonts that come in these massive acceptance contracts and people just hit agree. Uh, make sure people understand it. So that, that would be my advice around, uh, around the HIPAA side of things. Um, we got results of our poll. Um, where is your company on your IT, IoT strategy? Some just don't know, which is understandable. Some, a lot have not thought about it, which is also understandable. Um, about a third are in the planning stage, and about 15% have either begun planning or have a comprehensive strategy. I'd love to talk to some of you um, that have actually either in, in the beginning stages or um, have, have started to execute on a strategy just to sort of learn more about what you're expecting to see. Uh, and I'm actually serious about that. If, if anybody would be willing to just have an off-the-record chat about what you're doing and what you're, why you're doing it, um, go ahead and send me an email at scott at actualtechmedia.com. I would love to have you know, a 15- or 20-minute conversation to chat about, um, chat about what you're doing to learn a little bit. Um, Mike, I'm going to turn the um, presentation over to you for the next part of what we're doing. We're going to do more Q&A at the end of the event, so please stay tuned. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, this is a short section just talking about Pivot3. Um, we're a hyper-converged infrastructure company. Uh, we have a foundation in uh, video surveillance and IoT. And just a couple of things that we've learned um, as we've been on this journey and as we've helped our customers on this journey as well. So uh, the first thing, and we've mentioned this a number of times, there are going to be billions of devices out there, depending on which analyst you read, and um, they all have different opinions because they're projecting into the future. And honestly, it depends who's given them money that month as to how many devices it could be. Um, there are going to be billions. The same with data. We are going to be massive in data. Now, the interesting thing to point out, if we look at the volume of data created, 60 plus percent of that is going to be created by video. And as I said before, and as I said earlier, video is a classic example of IoT. And it's one of the pieces of advice that I give to all of our Pivot3 customers and prospects. There are really three very simple pieces. The first one is start with what you know. You've got video, you've had video, you've invested in the infrastructure, and video is a remarkably rich source of information. It can be used not only for security, but to drive business value as well. So don't be afraid to start there. What that does is it lowers your barrier to entry. And that brings me on to my second point. Don't try and IoT all the things. It won't work. There are so many options out there. There are so many choices out there. And if you try and get a little overexcited, like I tend to do, you try and IoT everything all at once. It's not going to work. IoT to me is all about layering. So start with that solid base of information. Again, video is a great place to start. And layer on top of that. Find 
uh, an analytics platform or find uh, an IoT sensor that works with video and deploy that. The cost will be much lower and you'll be starting on success. Now, the other thing around that in what you choose to IoT first is something with easily defined and measurable results. Don't do something nebulous. Don't do something that says we've reached one small subsection of our customers, but we've improved their lives eh, kind of ish by about that much. Go for something that says, actually, we drove this much revenue for our organization or we improved safety by this much. Uh, we reduced the number of incidents by this much. Go for something that is easily defined, metricable, and shows clear results. That will get you uh, more executive sponsorship, better executive sponsorship, and a willingness then, if you can demonstrate value, then to carry on your IoT journey. And then the third piece of advice is consult people. If you're a smart city, consult your public. If you're an organization um, that is using this for a corporate point of view, consult the workers. Not everyone may want to have a new access system or they may have concerns about a new access system which is tied to their Apple Watch or in one of the laboratories in Cambridge to an implanted microchip uh, in the fleshy part of their hand that does kind of door control, but also picks up some biometrics. If you're a hospital, a HIPAA organization, consult your patients. Consult the people, the public that deal with you every day and find out from them what would make life better. IT vendors, uh, IoT vendors are going to tell you their device is the single best thing. And I hear an awful lot of feedback. Going, oh, yeah, we had these guys in the other day and they just absolutely launched their pitch at us. And we sat there and went, that's lovely. That's a great technology. That sounds so cool. It's real sci-fi stuff. But it doesn't, why do we need it? We're, we're a small, um, we're a small law firm. We don't need traffic management. So it's things like this. We don't need an intelligent gating system. So find something that really works in that and consult people. So those are kind of the three pieces of advice uh, that I give people on, on their IoT journey. Now, some of the, um, some of the infrastructure pieces, I know some of, uh, some of the attendees here uh, are interested in this. Uh, Scott's mentioned it before. So core to cloud to edge, or core to edge to, uh, sorry, edge to core to cloud. Whether that's public cloud, private cloud, data center at the core, remote office, branch office at the edge, or even further out at the edge uh, than that. We spoke about manageability earlier. One thing we didn't mention, largely because I wanted to save it for here, is a centralized management point or a consistent management point is absolutely key. Now, consistency with flexibility or consistency in standardization or flexible standardization should never be mutually exclusive. You should be able to deploy what fits your purpose best? So I would always advocate looking for open standards. So is it a nice common standard, iSCSI or um, 5G or um, even Bluetooth or um, 802.11n or G? Is it a nice open standard? Am I communicating over something that's been hardened, been tested, been around a good while, is known to be stable? Try and avoid those proprietary protocols and those proprietary methods of doing things. Because, as Scott said earlier, those device manufacturers may go away. If they go away, have you left yourself vulnerable? We all live in fear of the day that our firewall's got so many ports open, it's like a sieve. Um, anything can come through and we got ports one through 9,999 open for some protocol or other. That's not giving you a great deal of security. That also that centralized management is going to give you your health and reporting and automation and orchestration. So in this system, the system is going to keep the eye on those tens of thousands of devices out at the edge. It's going to tell you when they go down, and you get, to, you get to make a decision. You get to make a decision, is it vital they stay up? Fire alarms, I would say yes, they are, but um, 
and that kind of thing. Or can I tolerate it being down for a little while? Yes, I lose some data, but in no uh, great shapes. But that centralized management with the orchestration and the intelligence around that is absolutely vital. And then again, the cloud, um, make your choice. There are plenty of data regulations in place that say certain types of data can't go into a public cloud. That doesn't mean there isn't a cloud option for you. Um, there may be something like an Iron Mountain who have a uh, government, um, uh, government certified cloud, a secure cloud in that respect, uh, that can provide that service for you. They can provide that flexible scalability for your really long-term kind of older archive data. I know that Amazon and Google are both making big strides in that uh, regulated environment in a if uh, in a pseudo public cloud uh, in that way as well. So really to sum up, pick up a nice open standard, consistent platform that you can deploy all of these from, but make sure that it's flexible and, uh, and keeps you operational uh, in that way. Now, just, I promise this is the only slide on this, um, just an, in, uh, an idea of where Pivot3 are deployed and the kind of people we work with. Uh, smart cities, I've already mentioned Bogota um, uh, down in Colombia. We also do work uh, all over the US, all over the world. Uh, we're deployed in, uh, I think it's 56 different countries now. Um, throughout the world doing uh, citywide initiatives. Uh, transit, um, pretty much anyone on the eastern seaboard who has ever been on mass transit is going to be on Pivot 3 somewhere. We provide uh, an awful lot of infrastructure there. Uh, our largest mass transit customer, we were talking about data scale earlier. The, the largest mass transit customer Pivot 3 has is around 25 petabytes of data. And that 25 petabytes of data is generated on a 90-day cycle. Can you imagine that in your organization, generating 25 petabytes of data every 90 days? It's kind of crazy. Casinos, absolutely. These are the IoT kings, by the way. If you've been in a casino recently, you have been IoT'd without even knowing it. There is a lot that they'll pick up from that. Uh, campuses. Um, UCF, uh, so University of Central Florida, for example, uh, Go Knights, uh, are one of our biggest customers. And we use those guys, or those guys use us for student safety. And we explore a number of options. It's not just video anymore. It's not just access control, but it's things like mobile device tracking. The ability to pick up uh, the Mac ID of a phone, set exclusion zones uh, around that to keep students safe if they're on their own at night, um, track other devices that may be in the area, uh, all of that to improve student safety. So it's not just, um, not just that. And then finally, airports. Uh, we have a little joke in Pivot3. If it's named after a US president and it's an airport, then it's likely to be on Pivot3. And you have no idea how much fun as a British citizen I have telling the TSA agents, uh, when they ask me who I work for, I tell them we're the guys that do all your video surveillance infrastructure, which is a wonderful thing to see the look on their face. So all of those things use IoT. A lot of them will use the same sensors and generate the same type of data, but analyze it and use it in a completely different way. A shopping mall, for example, may use that mobile device tracking data pick up the Mac ID of your phone and send a push notification with a coupon for a dollar off your next coffee. Whereas a airport might use that mobile device tracking to set an exclusion zone um, around certain sensitive areas. And should a, uh, should a mobile device breach that area, then all hell breaks loose, alarms go off and uh, guards appear. So IoT needs to be flexible. So find technologies that are flexible, work with those, and, uh, and run that way. So thank you very much for that. The last poll question is on the screen. Um, and, and Scott, I'll hand back to you to take us through the results. Sure. Um, we're going to let, leave the poll question up. We're just about out of time. We're going to chat for just a minute more while we have the last poll question up. One of the comments someone uh, made actually in the, in the Q&A is really interesting. And I, I, 
there was a video recently about um, traffic in New York City, which um, having driven in the city a number of times, I truly, truly despise it. But it was about how autonomous vehicles will also, I mean, potentially eliminate the need for traffic lights because they don't just communicate internally to determine whether or not they're going to run over somebody, but they communicate with one another. So you can adjust the traffic flow so that a vehicle never has to stop, so that they can weave in and out of each other. And I think that's really important. One of the, uh, Morgan um, from our audience basically says, that they need to communicate with each other to coordinate traffic. And that's something that's being worked on. There are these, these localized networks that are going to be powerful, and they're going to enable – and that actually has more outcomes than just a better traffic flow. It also is better for the environment, because one of the worst things for the environment is the stop and start we have with our cars, because that's when we have to apply more gas. Now, obviously, electric vehicles um, reduce a lot of that, but if it's, we're talking about gasoline vehicles, that can really be an environmental um, benefit as well. Um, we also have a comment about um, uh, a question about, and we can answer this briefly, but there's going to be lots of data to be processed. Big data and AI come to mind. Uh, we actually already asked that one. Sorry. So, uh, sorry, Scott. Just a quick uh, one on the one. cars. Yeah. Just a quick one on the cars. The other thing that you'll realize is that autonomous vehicles will follow the speed limits. And it may be the case that yeah. we get to a point where the autonomous vehicles themselves, we can increase those speed limits dramatically because the vehicle is going to respond faster in a more consistent way than any human would. So now journey times become incredibly consistent. And cars, as you see in the sci-fi movies, will just slot in seamlessly. So I think if you apply that level of consistency and known behavior, traffic jams should be a thing of the past. The roads will look completely stacked, but the autonomous cars will actually um, give you the ability to keep that traffic moving uh, at a great speed or a great rate much, much uh, more effectively and efficiently. So I think we may do that. Now, the other concept that I read about recently, and I'd be interested on, on your opinion on, is that car ownership may disappear entirely. And yeah. that a fleet of autonomous vehicles will just permanently be driving and you'll call one like an Uber. It'll arrive at your house. It will slot seamlessly into traffic. And this fleet, this giant fleet of autonomous cars will just continually circulate around, uh, around the world or around the U.S. Um, based on where people want to go. So I was in an Uber. Do you think that we could see that? I do. Um, I was actually in an Uber um, last year. And, uh, and in the Bay Area, <clears throat> and the guy said he was really looking forward to driverless vehicles. And I was like, well, that's interesting coming from an Uber driver. And he said, well, the beauty is, he goes, I'll go get a, a, a different job, and my car will just drive around and do my Uber for me while I'm at work. So basically, he would go to work and make money for, you know, for what he needed to do, while all day long he was monetizing his vehicle. So, I mean, he was, that's, his pers that's great. I do believe that we're, I think it's going to be really a fundamental shift as we get more automation in a good way, a fundamental shift, because, I mean, nobody really wants to buy a bunch of cars, but we have to, right? Um, it would be nice if we could just have fleets of vehicles driving us around. So, um, But we are, unfortunately, out of time. I'm going to share our results, um, and I'm going to give away a couple of, of gift cards. Um, the vast majority say it might be okay, but they're still investigating. So as far as that their infrastructure is ready for IoT. And we have a few that said, no way, we need help. And a very few that said, they're not going to do IoT anyway. Um, we do have two gift card winners. Before we give those away, I'd like to thank Mike for what turned out to be a great conversation. Thank you very much, Mike. No, thank you, Scott, for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a blast. Um, we have two $500 Amazon gift cards. And as soon as my screen refreshes, you'll, we'll know who they are. Um, gift card number one goes to Justin Schwab from Ohio. And gift card number two is going to Shannon Ryan from Illinois. We want to thank our audience for being here. Thank you to Pivot3 for being a, uh, participating in this event. Thank you again to Mike for what, turned, what was a fantastic. I love these sorts of events where we get to really engage the audience and, and just chat. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody.